Hi everyone, Ms. Calabrese here. Uh, welcome to the first of your recorded lectures for uh, Anatomy and Physiology 2. Um, in this video, we're going to be introducing you to the endocrine system and talking a little bit about the hormones produced by the hypothalamus and pituitary glands. All right, so your endocrine system, the basic function of your endocrine system is to regulate the body and to send information. Um, so in that way, it's very similar to your nervous system. So we spent a lot of time last term talking about the nervous system and how it sends information throughout the body. Um, and the endocrine system does that too, but it does it a little bit differently. Um, but both of them work together to control and regulate systems of the body. All right, so where your nervous system operates by sending electrical signals, if we can remember action potentials and how those were, um, were traveling along axons and, and jumping across synapses and going from one cell to another, the endocrine system, instead of using electrical signals, uses chemical signals. Uh, and those chemical signals are released into the bloodstream as hormones. All right, so hormones are chemical signals that, that are produced by glands that travel around the body and then they target specific tissues. All right, so not every cell in the body has receptors for every hormone. So there are specific hormones that target only particular cells um, and they can only um, initiate changes in the cells that have receptors for them. All right, so hormones are the signals that are traveling uh, through the body to, to transmit these messages, but they're not those messages aren't able to be picked up by all cells in the body. All right, so here's a comparison um, between um, endocrine control of uh, information and nervous control of information. So in, the, in picture A over here, we can see an endocrine cell. So this would be um, a cell that's in a gland that's producing a hormone, the, the chemical signal. So this, these hormone particles then get released into the bloodstream. They travel all throughout the body. Um, they can eventually leave the bloodstream and get received by their target cell. All right, so this is kind of a slow process. Uh, it takes a while for, um, for a chemical to travel all the way throughout the body and the bloodstream. Uh, and to get a significant amount of that chemical to a target tissue to initiate a response. Um, whereas your nervous system in picture B here, um, once we initiate an action potential, that goes really rapidly all the way down the axon, jumps across the synapse to that postsynaptic cell, and we initiate our response immediately. So nervous control is very quick. Um, endocrine, endocrine control can be somewhat slow by comparison. All right, so here's a, a just a really um, simple view of many of the important endocrine tissues in the body. Um, so I'm going to go over these kind of from top to bottom, and then we'll spend more detail talking about each one. All right, so the first one we see here is your hypothalamus. And hypothalamus is probably a structure that you remember from last term. So hypothalamus is part of your brain, right? It's part of the diencephalon of the brain. Um, but it's also important for your, uh, for your endocrine system. So your hypothalamus is kind of like the bridge between the nervous system and the endocrine system. So yes, it's part of your brain, but it also plays a large role here in the endocrine system. So the hypothalamus there is very closely associated with the master gland of your endocrine system, which is the pituitary gland. Right? So the pituitary gland um, kind of hangs off of, of the anterior end of the hypothalamus and sits sort of right behind your eyes. Um, also in your brain, you have your pineal gland. Um, pineal gland, we, we may have talked about um, in uh, AMP1 as well. Um, uh, the pineal gland releases hormones associated with maintaining your um, day and night cycles, so uh, maintaining your uh, circadian rhythm. As we move down into the neck, um, you have your thyroid gland. So thyroid gland sits so it's right at the base of the neck. And then on the posterior aspect of the thyroid gland, you have tiny glands called the parathyroids, which have their own function we'll talk about in a little bit. Moving down, um, just right on top of the heart sits a gland called your thymus. Thymus is going to be important for immune function. If we go down a little bit further, we see your adrenal glands. So the adrenal glands are these little um, uh, glands that sit right on top of your kidneys on either side. So you have two of those. Uh, and then here is your pancreas. So pancreas is important um, for a few different things, but, but one of the uh, major functions is producing 
uh, hormones associated with uh, glucose metabolism. And then as we move a little bit farther down, uh, we, get, we can see the gonads here. So in the females, uh, there would be ovaries, and in the males, there would be testes. Right? So those are the major um, glands associated with your endocrine system. And then we'll talk about the different hormones that each of those glands produce. All right, so um, some basic classification of hormones. So we can classify them um, based on their function. Um, so trophic hormones, anytime you see that root, um, the trope that has to do with uh, growth. Um, so tropic hormones um, are hormones that stimulate growth. Sex hormones are ones that stimulate um, reproductive tissue. Uh, and anabolic hormones st stimulate anabolism, which is the, the building of molecules. All right. Um, but more important than even the functional classification is the structural classification of hormones. So these are really two, two very important categories here for you to understand the difference between steroid hormones and non-steroid hormones. Um, so you're going to have to think back a little bit to uh, the structure of the different macromolecules that we talked about way back at the beginning of ANP1, um, how uh, lipids are different from proteins uh, in a molecular way. Um, so your steroid hormones are ones that are manufactured from cholesterol. So think of these as fat-based or lipid-based hormones. Um, so these guys are lipid-soluble, and hopefully we remember that lipids are generally not water-soluble. So fat, like oil and water, don't mix. All right? So steroid hormones do not dissolve in water, um, which means they have to travel around your body a little bit differently than non-steroid hormones. So non-steroid horm hormones are ones that are based on proteins. So, and we kind of classify them based on size here. So non-steroid hormones can be full protein, like insulin and parathyroid hormone. Those are full protein hormones. It could be peptide hormones, which are a little bit smaller in structure. So instead of being a full um, a folded protein, they're shorter peptide chains. Um, or they could be amine hormones, which means that they're basically just an altered form of a single amino acid, like, uh, for example, norepinephrine is one of these amine hormones, so very small structure. But these would all be considered non-steroid uh, because they don't have any uh, lipid in their molecular structure. Okay, so how do hormones work? Um, they basically work by, by finding their target cell um, and operating almost like a lock and key mechanism. So, um, so they work in a similar way um, to enzymes. So if you remember, enzymes work um, by, by uh, fitting into their substrate molecule, or, or I guess vice versa, the substrate fits into the enzyme, uh, and that enzyme will then initiate a change on the substrate. Um, hormones work very similar to that. So there's kind of a lock and key reaction between the hormone and the receptor on the target cell. Um, and unless the, that hormone fits in that receptor, you're not gonna initiate any change in the cell. So the communication will not go through uh, if the hormone uh, does not fit in the receptor. All right, so, so here's a kind of graphic of what that looks like. So hormones, again, chemicals traveling through the bloodstream here. So here's a little capillary. Uh, we can see these little hormones that are uh, represented as pentagon-shaped molecules here, little house-shaped molecules, um, they can leak out of um, the little clefts in these capillary walls um, and go into the surrounding tissue, but not every cell in the surrounding tissue is going to be a target cell, right? So we can see um, a, a, a hormone receptor combination here uh, because the hormone fits in that receptor, but right here, we're not going to get the hormone interacting with that receptor because the shape of the molecules don't work together, right? So these would be non-target cells over here because the hormone doesn't fit uh, into the receptor, whereas these would be target cells because the hormone does fit into the receptor. So these target cells are the only ones that are going to be able to respond to that hormone uh, that's, that's traveling uh, through the tissue there. All right. So let's talk specifically about steroid hormones and how those steroid hormones um, are going to interact with the cell, right? So uh, steroid hormones, because they're fat-based hormones, um, are, are able to easily pass through the cell membrane. So remember that your, your cell membranes 
your phospholipid bilayers, those are, those are lipid-based membranes. They're basically fatty layers that are surrounding your cell. Um, and because the membranes are made of lipids and these steroid hormones are made of lipids, they're able to just pass right through that membrane and enter into uh, the cell. And on the inside of the cell is where they find their receptor. So the receptor is on the inside of the cell in the case of these steroid hormones. So the steroid hormone um, lets itself into the cell by just passing through the phospholipid bilayer and then it's gonna meet uh, its receptor in the cytoplasm of the cell. Um, and then at that point, um, that's that hormone receptor complex can go ahead and enter into the nucleus and initiate whatever changes um, it's supposed to be directing on the inside of that cell. All right, so in, in this picture here, we can see not only how this steroid hormone enters into the cell. So we, here's our hormone, here's it kind of going into the cell and easily passing through that phospholipid bilayer where it's going to meet with its receptor and then um, enter into the nucleus and do its job there. Uh, but we can also see here how this uh, steroid hormone is traveling through the blood. All right, and so remember that lipids like steroids um, do not dissolve in water, so they're not going to easily travel through blood, which is water-based. Um, so we have to carry these steroid hormones with, um, with basically like a, a transport protein. So these little uh, protein molecules in the bloodstream actually act as escorts to the, uh, to the steroid hormones and help them, uh, help them move throughout the bloodstream without forming into clumps and, and causing problems. All right, so we need these plasma proteins to help carry steroid hormones through the blood. All right, non-steroid hormones um, have kind of like an opposite uh, problem here. So ster non-steroid hormones, these ones that are protein-based, these can easily travel through the blood. They don't need any carrier protein, plasma protein, um, to help them move throughout the bloodstream. So they travel really easily. Uh, but then when they get to the cell, their target cell, um, they do not, uh, they're not able to pass through that phospholipid bilayer in the same way that steroid hormones are. Right, so that's when they come, they reach the, the kind of end of the road for them is when they reach the phospholipid bilayer of the target cell. So in that case, um, they need what's called a second messenger. All right, so the non-steroid hormone is the first messenger, right? This is a chemical message that's being sent through the blood. Um, when they reach the, the, uh, the phospholipid bilayer, then they basically need to hand off this message to a second messenger, All right? So that second messenger, um, is usually a molecule called CAMP, cyclic adenosine monophosphate. So that CAMP um, basically receives the message of the non-steroid hormone and carries that message inside uh, to initiate whatever changes that the hormone was directing from the outside, right? So that, so that uh, protein hormone or non-steroid hormone never actually enters into the cell. It just passes its message along to the CAMP, kind of like handing off a baton in a relay race, right? So it just sends the message into the cell uh, in that way. All right, so here we can see what that looks like. So our water-soluble protein hormone uh, traveling through the bloodstream, um, easily traveling through the bloodstream without any carriers, diffuses um, out of that capillary, finds its way into the, into the target tissue, but then at that point cannot enter into the cell membrane. Um, so it's going to trigger uh, the internal response by, uh, by signaling that cyclic adenosine monophosphate molecule, and then that CAMP is going to carry the message forward from there and initiate whatever changes need to happen inside the cell as a response to that hormone. Okay, um, so how do we regulate hormone secretion in general? Um, for the most part, Hormones are controlled by negative feedback loops. So um, negative feedback loops, if you remember, are the basic way that your body maintains homeostasis. So um, homeostasis, again, just being the maintenance of stable internal conditions of the body, meaning that if we deviate from normal, if, if say um, your temperature, which is at its normal set point, goes too high, um, then a negative feedback loop will kick on to bring your temperature back down to where it should be. If your temperature goes too low, then another feedback loop 
will come on to bring us back on to uh, normal homeostasis levels of, of temperature, blood sugar, whatever um, the, the level might be that we're trying to maintain. All right, so here's an example of a negative feedback loop when it comes to the endocrine system. All right, so here we can see um, a baby nursing, so lactation is happening. So um, mother is producing milk. Um, milk uh, is going to take a lot of calcium, right? It takes a lot of calcium to make milk. So as mom's producing milk and the baby's drinking milk, um, her levels of blood calcium go down, right? So here we can see the, the calcium levels in her bloodstream. That's going to decrease her blood calcium because she's using all that calcium to make milk. Um, as the blood calcium levels drop low, um, that, that low blood calcium level is going to be detected by her parathyroid glands. So parathyroid glands are the ones that sit on the back of the thyroid gland, and they are monitoring levels of blood calcium. When they notice that blood calcium is low, um, they will uh, produce the hormone PTH. PTH stands for parathyroid hormone. Um, that parathyroid hormone then, like all hormones, gets released into the bloodstream. Um, it's going to find its way to its effector cells. In this case, the effector cells for parathyroid hormone are actually osteoclasts. So osteoclasts, remember, are the ones that uh, dissolve bony tissue and allow calcium to go back into the bloodstream. So the parathyroid hormone travels through the bloodstream until it finds osteoclasts. The osteoclasts, once they receive that signal from parathyroid hormone, will start dissolving bone. As they dissolve bone, they're going to release calcium uh, back into the bloodstream, and that calcium, uh, the, the blood calcium levels will then go back up to normal. And once we have normal blood calcium levels again, then, then the cycle will shut off, right? We're not going to trigger more parathyroid hormone release because we're already back to normal blood calcium levels. Right, so this is our way of maintaining negative, we're maintaining homeostasis by a negative feedback loop. Right, blood calcium levels go low, produce parathyroid hormone to dissolve bone to bring blood calcium levels back up. But once blood calcium levels are stable again, we're going to stop the release of parathyroid hormone um, because if we continue to re release parathyroid hormone at that point, then blood calcium levels will go too high um, and then we're out of homeostasis in the opposite direction. Right, so hopefully that makes sense as a negative feedback loop. All right, just a quick note on prostaglandins. Um, prostaglandins are kind of like lipid hormones, um, but these are more local hormones. So they don't travel um, in the bloodstream all throughout the body um, the way that we generally think of hormones as traveling. They, they basically just travel short distances to other cells within the same tissue. Right, so this is kind of like a like a local messaging system, um, more like more like walkie talkies so that cells can talk to each other locally versus like a, a telephone that they can call anywhere across the world. All right, so some ways that hormones interact here. Um, if one hormone allows another hormone to act, we, we refer to that as a permissive effect. So you need one hormone going in order for the other hormone to work. Um, it's a synergistic effect if two hormones produce the same response and kind of amplify that response. Uh, and it's an antagonistic effect when two hormones have the opposite effect. So if they're doing opposite action, um, then we consider that antagonistic. Um, and as we describe what some different hormones do going forward, um, I'll, I'll, I'll show you examples of what each one of these interactions looks like. All right, so I'm going to start talking about the, the individual glands here that are involved in creating these hormones and the actual hormones that they create and what those hormones do. So we're going to begin our discussion of this by talking about the hypothalamus a little bit. So remember that the hypothalamus is part of your diencephalon, part of the brain um, that controls homeostasis. It is also the, the link between your nervous system and your endocrine system. So this is how those two systems are going to talk to each other is through the hypothalamus. Um, so although it is a, a part of your nervous system, it does also create hormones. There is endocrine tissue here that creates hormones. Um, in this case, in the case of the hypothalamus, we're calling them releasing hormones um, because they, they signal the release of other hormones. 
right? So here's a kind of a picture where we can see the hypothalamus. So we're, we're zoomed in on the brain here. Um, we can see the, the thalamus here and then the hypothalamus down here, this kind of triangle shaped structure um, that's anterior to the thalamus. Um, the hypothalamus really is only releasing hormones that are going to go directly to the pituitary gland. And the pituitary gland is sitting right here, uh, right next to the hypothalamus. So this is not a long distance that we have to travel. The hormones that it makes um, are listed here. So growth hormone, releasing hormone, growth hormone, inhibiting hormone, thyrotropin releasing hormone, corticotropin releasing hormone, gonadotropin releasing hormone, and prolactin releasing hormone, right? So you probably noticed the common theme there, which is that these are all releasing hormones. And that basically what these are doing is traveling a short distance from the hypothalamus to the pituitary to tell the pituitary to release hormones, right? So for example, growth hormone releasing hormone leaves the hypothalamus goes to the pituitary and tells the pituitary to release the actual growth hormone, right? So growth hormone produced by the pituitary, but growth hormone releasing hormone um, has to signal its release and that comes from the hypothalamus, right? And same thing for this inhibiting hormone, uh, for thyrotropin releasing hormone, um, that's gonna stimulate the pituitary to release thyroid stimulating hormone, uh, corticotropin releasing hormone, is going to trigger the pituitary to release adrenocorticotropic hormone, right? So, so these all are kind of part of a, a cascade of hormone effects where one is going to affect another, which affects another, which in some case might even affect a third um, protein or a third hormone release. Okay, um, so quick note about this hypophysial portal system. So another name for your pituitary gland is the hypophysis. So the, the hypophysis um, is, is just another name that's a kind of more antiquated name for the pituitary gland. Um, but the, the system of blood vessels that connects the hypothalamus to the pituitary then is called the hypophysial portal system, referring to that, that name for the pituitary, which is the hypophysis. Um, so this is just a system of blood vessels that connects uh, the hypothalamus directly to the pituitary so that we can get immediate, almost, well, near immediate response from those releasing hormones uh, from the hypothalamus to the pituitary. All right, so here's a, another look at that so we can see a little bit more closely. So again, here's thalamus, here's hypothalamus here. Um, here's the little stalk that connects the hypothalamus to the pituitary that's called the infundibulum. Uh, and then down here is the pituitary, also known as the hypophysis. Um, so again, infundibulum here, and then pituitary or hypophysis here. Um, you'll notice when we're looking at the pituitary that we can divide it into two separate portions. We've got anterior pituitary and posterior pituitary, right? So posterior pituitary, obviously, in the back, um, anterior pituitary uh, in the front. All right, there's a, a good look at that portal system. So again, the portal system is just a series of blood vessels that are connecting the hypothalamus directly to the pituitary gland. So all those little releasing hormones that are created by the hypothalamus can travel very quickly to the pituitary. Um, they're gonna trigger the pituitary to release its own hormones. All right, so what hormones specifically does the anterior pituitary gland release? Um, well, quite a lot. Uh, so again, your pituitary is known as the master gland because it produces a whole bunch of hormones. So we're gonna go through these hormones one at a time and talk about what they do. Um, so your anterior pituitary releases a hormone called growth hormone. Growth hormone is also called somatotropin. Um, so here's growth hormone. Somatotropin because soma uh, is another word for body. Um, and trope, remember, means growth. So somatotropin means body growth. Um, so this promotes growth of the body. So when you're a kid, you release a lot of growth hormone, and that growth hormone is going to um, trigger body cells to, to grow and divide so that you can grow into an adult. Right? Um, but that growth hormone is not going to be released by the anterior pituitary unless it receives the growth hormone-releasing hormone signal from the hypothalamus. 
right? So, so we need that cascade to happen in order to trigger the release of growth hormone. Um, uh, anterior pituitary also makes a hormone called prolactin. Um, so prolactin is going to be important for breast development and also for the secretion of milk. Um, so, so creating milk um, after pregnancy. Um, and again, you're not going to create, you're not going to release prolactin unless your hypothalamus has told your pituitary to do this by releasing prolactin releasing hormone, which will then trigger the anterior pituitary to release prolactin, which will then travel in the bloodstream and trigger breast development and milk production. All right, um, other hormones that your anterior pituitary makes are thyroid stimulating hormone. So thyroid stimulating hormone um, promotes um, uh, the thyroid gland to do its job, uh, which we'll talk about in a second. But again, it, we need the thyrotropin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus to the anterior pituitary before the anterior pituitary will release the thyroid stimulating hormone. Then that'll go into the bloodstream and find its way to the thyroid gland. Um, similar concept here for adrenocorticotropic hormone. So this one, we need the corticotropin releasing hormone from the, from the hypothalamus that'll trigger the release of this ACTH, uh, and then the ACTH will find its way to the adrenal gland. Um, follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone, so FSH and LH, um, these ones are triggered to uh, be released by the gonadotropin releasing hormone. So gonadotropin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus will trigger anterior pituitary to release these two FSH and LH. FSH um, stimulates the production of follicles in the gonads, which are what your body uses to produce eggs and sperm. Um, luteinizing hormone um, helps uh, control the release of, um, of sex hormones like testosterone, estrogen, and progesterone. All right, so here's another example of a negative feedback loop. All right, so, so here we've got your, your hypothalamus. Um, your hypothalamus up here in the brain is going to be releasing that thyrotropin releasing hormone. So thyrotropin releasing hormone goes through the portal system to the anterior pituitary, and the anterior pituitary, once it receives that message, will start to create thyroid stimulating hormone. Thyroid stimulating hormone then goes through the bloodstream here and finds its way to the thyroid gland. The thyroid gland will then receive that message and use it to create its own hormones, uh, which we'll just call T3 and T4 for now. Um, and then as T3 and T4 are produced and released into the bloodstream, then our bloodstream levels of T3 and T4 go up. Once those levels go up, then we go on this long feedback loop way back to the brain. And the brain's like, okay, at this point now we have enough T3 and T4. We can stop releasing TRH. If I stop releasing TRH, we'll stop TSH. If we stop TSH, then we'll slow down production of T3 and T4. All right, so it's just a continuous feedback loop to maintain the right um, levels of these hormones in the blood, but not too much of any of these hormones in the blood. All right, so those were the six major hormones of the anterior pituitary gland. Your posterior pituitary gland, the one that sits in the back, um, also releases a couple of hormones, um, but he doesn't actually make the hormones himself, right? So whereas all six of those hormones in the anterior pituitary were actually made by anterior pituitary tissue, posterior pituitary is actually more nervous tissue, um, sometimes we'll refer to as neurosecretory tissue rather than being endocrine tissue itself. So although two important hormones are released from here, these hormones were actually made in the hypothalamus, um, sent to the posterior pituitary, and then the posterior pituitary releases them when it's told. Um, so these two hormones here are antidiuretic hormone, or ADH, uh, and oxytocin. So antidiuretic hormone uh, does, does what it sounds like it does. So it stops diuresis. So it's, it basically um, makes you retain water. Right, so it's, it's retaining water by reabsorbing water from the kidneys. Um, and so this, this does things like increase your blood pressure and reduce the volume of your urine. Um, oxytocin um, has two main functions here. 
Um, one is to stimulate the contraction of uterine muscles, so a smooth muscle lining of the uterus contracts during labor. Um, oxytocin released by uh, posterior pituitary will stimulate those contractions. Um, it is also part of your milk ejection reflex. So when a baby is nursing and milk is actually released from the breast to the baby, um, that's the result of oxytocin. So uh, different from prolactin, so prolactin had to do with the production of milk. Oxytocin has to do with the release of the milk out of the, the ducts of the breast. All right, so here's kind of a, a just a slide of reviewing all of those hormones from, from the pituitary gland. Um, this is a slide from your learning map, so you're able to go in there and look at these um, individual hormones and re review them at your own speed. Um, a quick note on some disorders that are associated with, um, with the pituitary gland. Um, so this first one here is called acromegaly. So acromegaly happens when you have um, secretion of extra growth hormone um, during adulthood. So normally growth hormone gets released um, and you, it triggers your, uh, your bones to lengthen and grow, right? So this is how you go from being a tiny fetus to, to a full grown adult is your bones get longer and longer and longer um, until the epiphyseal plates close. So remember that the, 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 your long bones have uh, plates of uh, growth plates that are um, allowing them to get longer and longer. Once those plates seal, um, in early adulthood, then you're, you can't get any taller after that. If you continue to release too much growth hormone after those plates have sealed, you're still going to trigger bone growth. But since the bones can't get longer, they just get um, more robust. So they, they just get larger in size. Um, and so that can cause some uh, changes in the appearance of the face as bones of the, the cheeks and the jaw become thicker um, because the because they're getting um, this increased signal of growth hormone to keep growing, but they're not able to actually get um, longer, so they just get thicker. So that's acromegaly. Um, a gigantism is what happens if you have hypersecretion of growth hormone um, in childhood. So if the epiphyseal plates are not closed yet, and excess growth hormone is just gonna continue the growth of those bones. They're just gonna get longer and longer and longer. Um, so gigantism is what happens when you have hypersecretion of growth hormone in childhood. Um, if you have hyposecretion, so not enough growth hormone, um, that leads to a condition called pituitary dwarfism. So not enough growth hormone to trigger those, that bone growth. All right, um, so quick concept check here. What is the hypophyseal portal system? What hormone stimulates the reabsorption of water by the kidneys? What hormone stimulates contractions of uterine muscles in labor? And what kind of feedback loop maintains homeostasis? So I'll give you a minute to think about it. All right, and there's our answers. So the hypophyseal portal system is a network of blood vessels that connect the hypothalamus to the pituitary gland so that all those releasing hormones can get directly to their destination. Uh, the hormone that stimulates reabsorption of water by the kidneys is antidiuretic hormone. Uh, the hormone that stimulates contractions uh, in labor is oxytocin. And the type of feedback loop that maintains homeostasis is a negative feedback loop. All right, so I hope that was helpful. Uh, introduction to the endocrine system. Let me know if you have any questions.